Welcome to the Hack Hunted and Radio Show number 12. I'm your host, Jim Minadio, and I'm the president of Zero Surge, a manufacturer of power quality filters that are used for surge protecting sensitive electronics. With Zero Surge, you have peace of mind that your electronics are kept safe. Today's guest is Steve Walker, who is a private wealth advisor from Walker & Associates, a private wealth advisory practice of Ameriprise Financial Services. We'll discuss the world of financial planning and how this industry has been innovating over the years and where he sees the future of financial planning. Uh, of course, no uh, stock picks today. So <laughs> I won't, I won't you, hold you to them. <laughs> and as always, I'll end the show with some uh, historical perspective. Today, I'll give you the brief history of the mutual fund. Um, but first, the weather, which I'm not ready to... Let's bring this over here. All right, the weather here. Well, this is actually the first time in the 12 weeks I've done this where I see blue sky. Every week at this time of day, it's thunderstorm, thunderstorm, thunderstorm. Was so, you're reaching over to click on the computer, I thought you were just looking out the window, be no. like, hey guys, it's yeah. uh, nice and blue outside. Go yeah. outside and enjoy the day. <laughs> no, it is, uh, you know, I do that too, but uh, no, there's uh, the weather forecast is here, so uh, they like, uh, uh, even though, you know, you're probably watching this after this already happened, uh, you know, there will be th- uh, thunderstorms tonight. It just, uh, there's a thunderstorm watch until 9 p.m., uh, low down to 60. Tomorrow it looks like the weather will be a little nicer, down to 75, and then 71 on Friday with rain, and then the weekend looks pretty good again, another like mid-70s weekend, so that's exciting. Always nice to get out to do things, um, yard work and the such. Um, all right, so let me think if I got everything else straight here. Oh, we'll get to the commercials in a minute. Um, we're behind on that too. So uh, let's start off. Welcome, Steve. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate the uh, opportunity to sit down and chat with you today. Okay, great. And um, so what I thought I'd do first, before we start getting into it too, to, we had our Hack 100 and Meetup last Thursday, so I'd like to wrap it up real quick. Um, basically, what we did, we did uh, speed pitching. So um, we didn't have it. We usually have a guest speaker, but because it was August, we figured it'd be less attended. Uh, we did get, though, about 20 people. Uh, to show up, which was pretty good for us. So uh, what we did was um, I created a list of 10 real things and 10 things from movies. So example, like lightsaber, you know, Death Star, um, Harry Potter's wand, and then real things like a mousetrap, sliced bread was one, a pizza, a microwave oven. Okay, and so what you had to do is you had two minutes to sell us on this product. And you had to pretend this product had never existed before. So the audience had to pretend like this is, you know, you've never seen a mousetrap. Right. So sell a mousetrap as if you never, you know. I wanted to hear the pitch of selling the lightsaber. Right? The that, lightsaber. That, that almost sells itself, I think, right? Well, the thing was, it just, <laughs> it was sort of, I randomly mixed them together and I was randomly handing them out. And um, the first person, he was one of our, you know, funnier speakers that, you know, I could sort of count on him to get it, the ball rolling. Uh, this guy Mike, and he did a great job as far as um, he did get the lightsaber. It happened right. to be at the bottom of my pile, and I was kind of. And the way to make it even too was everybody didn't get their product until um, they all had the same amount of time right. to sell it. So, yeah. say I gave you yours first, right. and then I gave well while you were thinking about it, I told the idea, right. so you had the time to think about it. And then when you went, I handed the next one to the next right. person. So it's like kind of like baseball, you yeah. know. Next batter yeah. then next batter next batter and so that way everybody had the same amount of time right and but what happened was it everybody then started feeding off each other's right. pitch so the first one being lightsaber you know he started doing like it could cut down wood it could do right. all these household yeah. chores and you know cut bread and then when the guy had the sliced bread one he's like well as long as you don't use a lightsaber you yeah. won't toast the bread yeah so it's like they would they would That's feed it, neat, or right. the one that sold the next one was actually the Death Star, right. and he's like, well, if you want to kill more than just one person at yeah. a time, <laughs> you know, and and you don't want to use this cheap little yeah. lightsaber, you know, that, it was like That's so that pretty neat. it yeah, just that, all you know. like built on each other, and everybody had a really, you know, everybody was cooperative in that regard, and um, I think only two out of the twenty people ended up not wanting to do it, right. that felt a little intimidated maybe by the room or, you know, the concept what we're doing, but. Right. Um, even the few that at first I didn't think wouldn't do it. Like this one lady, she was balking at these different, I kept giving her ones that happened to be like science fiction stuff. Right. And she's like, I don't know this. Yeah. I don't know this. <laughs> so I finally just grabbed a water bottle and right. said, sell this. Yeah. 
she got up there and says, don't you hate it when your landfills are not filled enough with plastic? <laughs> well, I think that's the, the, the thing, not the, 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 the cooperative, cooperativeness that you're talking about, but just the energy that you get into that. And if everybody's having fun, it just builds that momentum and everybody's yeah, exactly. having a good time as opposed to if everybody's serious. So no, that, that sounds like an awesome event. Yeah. So it was a, it was a good event. And then next, so next month it'll be uh, September 26th for uh, Thursday night, seven, the Lone Eagle Brewing Company. Uh, Bill Cheswick is going to be our speaker. He's a um, former AT&T engineer, Bell Labs guy from, you know, he's had like 50 years of experience as an engineer and has probably as many talks, right. you know, lined up. And so we picked one and um, I believe it's going to be about security. I think Mark has the write up on it. He'll put it on the Facebook page. But um, and then we'll also be revealing hopefully the uh, Hack Hundred and Beer that we picked some ingredients from before. Bob didn't have time to brew it for the last meeting, but he promises this that he'll have it ready for this meeting. So uh, come out and we'll have our own. If it's good enough, they'll he'll add it to the lineup as a regular beer. Hey, there you go. That that, that made it entice me just to be there. <laughs> <laughs> I'll so, taste the beer for you. <laughs> all right, let's see what time we're at. Okay, so we're almost at the first break, but. What I like to do, we always talk um, a news story, um, and this happened was published uh, yesterday in the uh, by Samanda Dorger was her name. I didn't print out the publication, so I apologize for that. Um, but she just uh, let's see who is a bank rate. I guess is a popular finance site. They do a lot of the. Um, they're usually the ones you Google when you're trying to look up. If you're looking up for mortgage rates, rates or CD like rates or something, yes, yeah, so right. I, I so they, remember with the website. So they have a uh, they created a list of the uh, the best states and the worst states to retire in. So they they base it based on uh, home value, the value of the dollar, uh, low crime rate, uh, temperature, average annual temperature, and then the wellness rank within the state. So how healthy people are. So what would you think that the number there's two states tied? So what would you say they are? I mean, I'd have to throw Florida out there. I think. Well, let's see. Florida actually wasn't even in the top five. Interesting. Because um, they gave us the top ten, no, the top fifteen, and then they gave us the bottom fifteen. So it's somewhere in the middle. Because it wasn't in the top. I guess the other one I would try to throw out there. Because is, I guess you got to look at the crime. Yeah, yeah. And the housing value. Well, the housing price is pretty good. Right. Temperature. I don't know if that was good or bad because it could be hot or cold. But maybe the wellness issue. But that probably feeds on itself. You have a lot yeah. of older people. I don't I'm know trying, out. <laughs> trying to think where all of our clients have moved to. We're all over the U.S. Uh, North Carolina's been You'd a be popular surprised. place. It's actually. Well, this is the. The least expensive. Okay. So this is not necessarily the best. Right. Okay. So it's uh, Missouri and Michigan. Hmm. It's, it's interesting because I've seen those reports before because uh, I have clients will ask us in terms of you know, where should I retire based on those kind of factors. And one of the reports I read came back with Pittsburgh. Yeah. So I showed the client like, here you go. Here's Pittsburgh. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, but it's cold in the winter. I said, hey, that was not one of your factors. Uh, right. With right. That. Well, I know that I have a friend who moved, um, he retired in Arkansas, mm -hmm. which is number four on this list Yeah, for that same reason. It's just uh, the cost of living. You well, know, the it, value of your dollar is higher there. I, I think that a lot of the, the financial factors are very important in terms of stretching your retirement nest egg as long as possible. But I think when we talk with our clients, one of the most important parts is, you know, that new social circle. You know, as we, we talk with clients who are retiring, getting ready to move, it's like when you bought your house here in Jersey, because that's where we're based. Mm -hmm you didn't think about the friends you're going to make or, you know, what you're going to be doing or, you know, your involvement in the community and so forth. And that's why it's very scary for people when they get ready to move from New Jersey because of the high real estate taxes and family mm -hmm. moving apart is who am I going to talk to <laughs> during the day? You know, do I like to play golf? What are my hobbies? How close am I to family with that? Mm -hmm. I said, uh, I think Delaware has been one of the bigger ones for clients moving to, cause you're still within shot to come back here to, to Jersey. Right. Um, if you're down there, you can go to the beaches, and you know it's enticing to get family to come visit you. Mm. It's you know, on the lower side of expenses. Uh, you know some of the real estate taxes that we hear back are like a thousand dollars a year. Oh, they're definitely less. <laughs> As somebody who owns real so, estate in Delaware, I can tell you that they are much. Yeah. Basically, I think we're paying about almost an eighth of what you would pay, even though our property is smaller down there because it's a smaller house, but. 
Um, you know, probably if you at apples to apples, it's probably an order of one fifth. Yeah. The uh, the property tax. But I think that's. But the, then you also have the schools there are much worse. Well, yeah. You have to send your kid to private school if you want to have anything comparable to say North Hundred in high school. Right. Well, typically the ones who are moving are the retired clients, and you know that's one of their their. I don't say issues, probably the wrong word, but you know when you look at your real estate taxes here in Jersey and how much goes towards. You know, education, and everybody said, "Look, we've paid our dollars for education. We, you know, we've we've paid our share. Let's move somewhere else. Elsewhere, it's not going to be as high." And but again, they don't want to move away from family. And we've had experiences where clients have moved, you know, to areas where they're, you know, they then feel remote. Right, right. And we've had clients who've moved multiple times in retirement because again, it's this whole new thing, this whole new world of where do we need to be? And then again, depending on their family and children, and grandchildren, how far away yeah, they are. Yeah, the grandchildren definitely. You know, I mean, that's our, our neighbors that are down in Delaware. They spend a lot of time driving up the Philly area to, yeah. to help out during the school year. They'll even go. Some of them have issues where they'll, they'll go up almost every day. Yeah. And that's like a two-hour drive every yeah. day up yeah. and down through Delaware through Philly, yeah. which is crazy. I, 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 it's important for, for our role when we're, we're helping clients plan on where to retire. It's important to know the rules and, and what tax breaks you may get. But by no means is it number one, because again, we deal with relationships and making sure that the people are happy and comfortable. And that's the most important part. Again, finding, you know, what's the social activities that are there? You know, if you're in the art community, maybe you're moving to Santa Fe or somewhere like right, that. Right. So or Austin or something. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I think that with those reports, it all depends on where the people, I, I'd be curious to see like uh, the Michigan, like where were the people moving from to Michigan? Right, right. You know, I think just based on, you know, uh, geographic location and then how far they're moving from family and so forth. Right. Well, Michigan is pretty central, too. So yeah. if you lived in Illinois, maybe you'd move to Michigan yeah. or Ohio or something. But just to finish it out, the uh, the more expensive ones, the top ones, obviously New York, number yeah. one. California, number two, yeah. because of the home value, probably. Uh, New Jersey's number three, right. which we would figure. <laughs> Maryland is number four, which has surprised me a little bit, but... I guess it's because I, the value of the dollar in Maryland is not doesn't take you as far. I think maybe the radius or the the closeness to D D C is that too. Yeah, and uh, Connecticut. So yeah. obviously the big Northeast states in California, and then surprisingly Hawaii was six. But you think that would be number one? But yeah. I guess because they also have a lot less crime, right. and obviously their weather is much better. Yeah, maybe that <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the overall equation in, in your yeah. scoring, they got higher grades on those as opposed yeah. to the lower grades on the higher expenses. Like so, Illinois was eleventh. So mm -hmm. yeah, so the eleven, so an Illinois person may move to Michigan if if financial is an issue. Yeah. Um, so that's that. All right. Yeah. So we're at our first commercial break already. Uh, so we'll do that, and then we'll be right back with Mr. Steve Walker as soon as I figure out which. Make sure we're at the right uh, break here. Hold on. Oh, folks, you know what that music is. That's the time for modern design. This blue thing is a really new trend. A lot of the designers are trying to introduce blue as a new cabinet color. This is topical for you guys. <laughs> this is really topical. And the mother said, well, I'd like her room to be gray. And, and the little girl said, Mom, gray is the color of depression. <laughs> Hi, this is Rich Scuderi of Modern Design. We're on live every Wednesday from 2 to 3, and you're listening on WHCR-DB. You're listening to WHCR-DB, HuntingtonChamberRadio.com, brought to you by the Hunterdon County Chamber of Commerce, the voice of business. Did you know that one in five people are affected by mental illness? NAMI Hunterton is the locally affiliate for NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. We are all volunteers and all our programs are free of charge. We offer Family to Family, a 12-week course for families that have an adult member with a mental illness. Another popular program is In Our Own Voice, where individuals who are living with mental illness discuss their challenges and their progress in overcoming those challenges. Another course we offer is Basics, a six-week course for families with a child or an adolescent who has experienced mental illness. We also have a monthly support group for families on the third Thursday of every month. Please call NAMI Hunterton at 908-284-0500 for more information about any of our programs or to join. NAMI Hunterton, the voice for mental health in Hunterton County. 
When it matters most, our award-winning team of emergency physicians and nurses provide sophisticated care 24 hours a day. Superior emergency care at a moment's notice. Hundred in health care, your full circle of care. All right, we're back. Uh, Hack Hundred in radio with Jim and Audio and uh, Steve Walker. So we were talking about retirement places. I guess um, the reason I invited him was to talk about uh, the world of financial planning. Um, he's been my p- financial planner for, what, 17, 18 years yeah. probably? Something like that. Don't age us that quick, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's been a while. And uh, he helps out with our uh, with the Zero Search stuff too. So, um, And I've seen, you know, over the years, I mean, initially it used to be, you know, the Internet, you couldn't download a report. It was just, you know, I had to go to you and yeah. – you had to print out a stack of papers to give us to look at. Remember the little, um, the very thin, like newsprint kind of yeah. uh, prospectuses yeah. and things like that. Um, you know, so there's obvious changes like that. Um, but what would you say is like the biggest change in 20 years of you doing this? You know what? I, I, I think it's the speed that, that things are done. And, and when you sent me over the topics that you want to talk about in terms of the evolution of the business, the financial planning business, and I've been doing this for 25 years now. Yeah, I, I took a deep breath and sat back. I'm like, wow, let me see. Uh, we didn't have email when I started. Um, we didn't have our own computers. You know, you had one central computer in the office that did the planning software, and you'd put in your inputs you know, from the client, and they would go to Minneapolis, our home office, and a day later you'd get the results <laughs> if the client was on track yeah. in terms of education planning to where we are now today, which is so exciting of – when you log on to your Ameriprise website that you see where you are in terms of your goals, not just the account balances because any given day, depending on when you log in and most clients log in after an 800 point down day um, and just see a value up or down, but now making it live and saying, look, you're on track to retire or on track to, you know, send your children to college. If you've been doing the things we've been doing together. And when I talk about speed, it, it also means in terms of our working relationship with clients where, we can communicate faster and stay more in touch because I think that's the most important part. There's so much that's out there information wise that, you know, investing can turn into gambling very quickly if you're not careful. Yeah. Has it been basically seems like there's more impatience in the markets too. Yeah. And I think company, like even from a company level, if a company doesn't do well in one quarter, they, okay, we're out of here. We're done with that stock. Whereas, and I think a lot of it is, yeah. And a lot of that is, um, computer driven algorithms and, and those kinds of things. And, 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 you know, this, you know, you talk about this, the nanosecond of trading and so forth. And I, I, I might've told you a story uh, my roommate from college was a trader on the floor of wall street. And he had some infamous pictures during the, uh, 08 crash <laughs> that, uh, we used to call him like, Hey, you made CNBC again. He said, ah, don't talk to me. Uh, but we talked at that time. I said, well, how's it going? He goes, I'll be honest with you. He goes, I think they don't need us anymore. You know, it's being more computer driven. It's more trading within a range. There's less, you know, giving us the option to decide on what the price is. And it's because of the volume that they can't wait for us to figure out if this is the price we should set on the bid and the ask. It's got to be, you know, right. within that. And that's where you see that the trading, you know, at, at such a high frequency with that. So our role is to help smooth things out. You know, as I said, I, I kind of kid that. I'm more of an emotional investor or emotional manager than an investment manager because if I can help you keep your emotions in check during these times, we'll be fine. Because the basics always work. It's just the noise that comes about from the media and so forth where, yeah. you know, the market sold off today. It was down 200. You know, it's a half a point. Big deal. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it, I think a lot of that is just kind of filtering through it, but it's also kind of breeds into what's going on in the market and taking – you know, uh, you know, a, a, a Twitter post from whoever, yeah. <laughs> not with their side of the aisle, not being political, but both sides are as bad, but just, and then kind of running with it one way or the other. So I think that's the thing we've kind of had to remind clients about that. Okay. Look, this is normal, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. It seems like to me too, that, um, some of the differences from, cause I've been following, you know, my wife and I have been doing this stuff even before we met you for several years. So we've probably done it about the same amount of years you've yeah. been in doing this professionally. So like, it seems like one thing that's different too is 
um, and I don't know if it's just our personal experience, but getting the kids a financial plan earlier on yeah. than you did 25 years ago. Like, you know, 25 years ago, you didn't even get kids social security numbers yeah. when they were born. Yeah. Now it's like, as soon as you're born, they give you that card right away and they yeah. say, here you go. You know, so it's because they're trying to, you know, get involved with uh, well, maybe college planning, the cost of college, maybe that's the reason, but. I think that's been one, and that was one of the things we were talking about before we started the show was, you know, in terms of the, the next generation and, and getting them involved. And I think that with the generation that's getting out of college, we're having more of them come to us as opposed to other generations, like my generation, you know, would, you know, it was now, and maybe it's now because of this technology that it's easier to meet with a financial advisor. And I think part of it is, you know, for us with the college education expenses is parents have had very open and honest discussions. I mean, we have with, with my son who's in college of like, here's your tuition bill, <laughs> like, and here's what we're trying to do. And here's what we're trying to, you know, get you to the next level. And I think that a lot of them have seen us through the years with their parents and they're like, well, if my parents trust Mr. Walker and Walker's associates, maybe I should sit down with them. Yeah. And part of what we've done in the practice is, is we have uh, our junior advisor, Kyle Osgood, who's a millennial himself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he, he is very adept in understanding because he's going through the same life that they are. And I think that's that bonding thing of look, you know, whether it's student debt or buying the first house or whatever it is, it's like, Hey, if we can go through this together, yeah, we can help out and we've embraced the technology in, in terms of, you know, getting them on the same page and, and, and making it bite size for them so they can understand and then having them like, hey, whatever it is you need us to look at, I would say to be very corny, wherever a dollar goes in your life, you should be calling us and mm -hmm. let's help you out because that's where, you know, we can get you on that path, you know, right away. It said, my son's interned for us the past couple of summers and he found an article um, about you know, the, the power of investing and starting early. And if you save a hundred dollars a month, right. you know, starting at 18, you'd have a million by 65 at a nominal, mm -hmm. you know, growth rate. And he's right. like, is this true? I'm like, yeah, here's the numbers. I prove it. He's like, all right, I need to open. What kind of account can I open? I'm like, you do a Roth IRA. We kind of walk through it. He's like, all right, it's all. So it's that next generation. I think it's knowing that the power is there to, you know, start early and then kind of taking that relationship with it. But, yeah. You know, and I think too, like the, because, the next generation doesn't have traditional jobs either. Yeah. So like say my, you know, my daughter, right? She has a lot of different things she's trying to do is almost like entrepreneurial things. So she has to start realizing that now is a good time to put some of the profits away instead of, you know, maybe buying a, you know, a drink or something, yeah. taking that, that latte money and putting it in <laughs> so, into some investment, you know, that's, yeah. that's, uh, that's definitely, I think the difference too, like when I first started in chemistry world, you know, my first job was a big company and first thing they hand you is the, you know, the 401k application. Yeah. So you didn't have to think about it or even some of them, even like uh, my wife still was getting pension, yeah. you know, that kind of stuff. So, uh, I think that's something that they have to realize early on now too. Yeah. And there's just a lot more education about it, I guess. Um, what else is there in the financial world? So the other one I noticed the big trend that we sort of talked about a little bit off offline was the fiduciary. Yeah. So that's changed too, right? Because in the past, you didn't, nobody even knew what that word meant, let alone cared what it meant. Yeah, and, and it, that's been an interesting thing because with with the mayor prize, you know, who is, is who we're affiliated. So why don't you with, explain what that is too for yeah, people who don't so know? So to, to very simplify it down, it means having your client's best interest as the primary, as opposed to commissions and so forth. Um, the interesting part that as Ameriprise financial advisors, you know, that's how we were raised. Um, that's always been how, you know, the, the standard that we set, uh, as a certified financial planner myself, that's number one. Um, and for us, it really hasn't been a big issue other than paperwork. <laughs> one more letter you get from Ameriprise saying, we've always been a fiduciary, just letting you know, if people ask, if you've if we're doing fiduciary, yes, we always have and we always will. Um, but again, I think it's it's almost like it should be, you know. And, and that's where I said, you know, we've had class questions about it. like, no, we always are, and here's what we are, and then here's kind of the the ninety page definition from the lawyers and so forth like that. But uh, I think it it's important that you know 
your advisor has your best interest. It almost means it's like common sense. Like, why wouldn't they? Yeah. Um, but sadly, we run across that and we see what happens and so forth. And I think for us, it's we always talk about relationships and, and, and so forth. And look, the numbers will work themselves out at the end of the day. It's, it's about making sure that, you know, are you comfortable with what you have? Do you have an understanding of, of what you are? And I think the, the thing that we've seen in the industry is now more transparency. So you understand what the cost you're paying for strategies, advice, investing, which I think is fine. I mean, again, mm-hmm. we've done that too and kind of broken it out and, and explained it and here's what we're doing because yeah, we'll come across things that, that, that aren't. And I think that's good. I mean, it, it's, it's good just to understand what – you're getting for the value you're receiving and then make sure more importantly you're getting that value and if you're not then we need to have a conversation and we'll talk about it yeah i think the you know in the past dealing with other you know i've, I've been you know cold called over the you know the years you know just here by the stock you know yeah. there's that level of stuff which people know now i mean you don't hear those much yeah. anymore because we're not allowed to because <laughs> it's, it's you know, basically you know there's been many movies yeah. uh you know with the uh just think of that movie uh, boiler room yeah where they go out and cold call people with fake companies and do this pump and dump stuff with yeah. the stocks. And I think there's still people who, um, you know, like my father, even he's very independent and wants to do his own investing. and But he's playing with mutual funds for the most part, which is still dealing with other people's fiduciary advice. He just is just following that yeah. person's. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like hiring some a piece of somebody's professional opinion for things. So. Um, but I guess the difference is like what you get involved with is like more than just stocks and bonds. Yeah. It's, you know, it's the college planning, it's end of life planning. It's even, you know, you have to deal with your parents, you have to deal, um, you know, with housing, you know, let's get all that rolled in together because one affects the other and you can't do one without the other. Yeah. And if you don't, even if you don't get involved, like say you're not a realtor, so you're not going to tell me what the, the real estate market is. But you're going to tell me, hey, just, you know, if you're going to get into that, you know, do you have enough money for this, this, and this? So it's more like a check yeah. on your id. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I, I got a call the other day from a client who wanted to buy a a, a, a hobby car. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was like, what? And so we're talking about it. And I'm like, have you run this by your wife? <laughs> and he said, uh, yeah. And she told me to call you. <laughs> I said, uh, tell your wife. I said, no. <laughs> and because I, again, knowing the situation and, and so yeah, forth. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it, the, the fiduciary is, is big because I, I think it's going to put people in alignment who weren't. And that way we're, you know, there, there, there's no issues. Look, there's, there's always a bad apple in every industry. Mm-hmm. And the more we can kind of weed that out and, and so forth. And I think that's where I've always been very proud of Ameriprise and our compliance department and, and how much we know and how much we're, you know, making sure that we're, you know, taking care of and, and doing the right things and documenting and all that stuff because that that makes sure that we're on the same page. So when you, you know, uh, you know, we're talking about something, you have a full understanding. It's not like, well, I didn't realize there was you know, this cost or surrender yeah. charge or whatever it might be with that. Um, and I think that's, that's important. I think that's good for our industry. It makes us stronger in terms of, you know, because, yes, you, you, there's many movie about our industry. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. Some are very, very entertaining. <laughs> All right, so uh, I guess we're at another break here, so uh, we'll do that and be back more with, uh, make sure I get the right one here, uh, with Steve Walker. USA Radio News with Tim Berg. Forecasters believe Hurricane Dorian is likely to approach the North Carolina coastline early Friday morning. Lieutenant Governor Republican Dan Forrest tells Fox News that people should heed evacuation orders. People really need to pay attention to the water levels rising and those types of things. If you have the ability to get out, you should get out. These storms are still massive storms. Cleanup is starting in the Bahamas as Hurricane Dorian has killed multiple people there and left a path of destruction as when the storm hit the island, it was a Category 5 hurricane. President Trump is defending the escalating trade war with China. We have a lot of money because of the tariffs we've taken in. We've taken in tremendous, many billions of dollars of tariffs from China. The president, speaking with reporters at the White House on Wednesday, also noted that the federal government will continue to help farmers who are struggling in the trade war. The president did also say he's keeping his eye on Hurricane Dorian. This is USA Radio News. There's no question you need omega-3s, but which form should you take? 
fish oil, or krill oil. Scientists have debated this for years. Luckily, there's a new solution to satisfy everyone. It's called Krill Omega 50 Plus. It combines ultra-pure fish oil and joint-soothing krill oil together in just one tiny pill. It's so powerful, it can promote the health of your heart and your arteries. And if that wasn't enough, it can also boost your joint comfort in just days. We're so sure Krill Omega 50 Plus will work for you. We'll even send you a free bottle to put to the test. The debate is over. It's not fish oil or krill oil. It's both. And now it's free. Just pay $4.95 for shipping and claim your free bottle. Call now. 1-800-399-6392. 1-800-399-6392. That's 1-800-399-6392. Oh, sorry, I'm back. This is Jim and Audio again with Hack 100 and Radio, Steve Walker. Uh, again, the weather, uh, as I said before, half an hour hasn't changed in half an hour, so it's going to be thunderstorming tonight. Uh, again, if you're watching this in the future, uh, let's see how right we were. We'll say that the temperature on Friday is going to be 75, so uh, we'll have a pool to see how correct that is. Uh, maybe we'll, that's what that's one thing we can do. Maybe in the future we'll have predict the weather and then see who gets closest. You know, we could do some kind of prize or something. I would love to have that job to be a weatherman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, I think be, it's uh, gonna rain today, people. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, nowadays it's probably even easier with all the computer modeling. Yeah. It's like, you know, and then so many different weather services. It's almost like you. You know, I wonder if any of it ever stole from each other their forecasts. I mean, well, I'd, I'd like to again. I mean, how they, would you prove that? Well, it's <laughs> kind of like getting your performance report on your investments. I'd love to have yeah. on the bottom, you know, of the the daily of you know storm champion, whatever you know. Yeah. Is, he's I'm sixty seven percent this year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're talking about uh, financial planning and investing in general. Um, so I guess in the time we have left, what do you see as the future? Like what in twenty years from now? I mean, a lot of it is to do with I guess political, right? Because if IRAs exist, 401ks get, you know, yeah. Social Security gets privatized, all these kind of things. Let's assume that we're just on a, you know, course where not much innovative on the government side is going to happen. Right. What would you say, you know, what could happen then in the future as far as? I'll be honest. I mean, I, I was thinking about this too as, as I was walking over is I think at the core there won't be any change because if I think about the way that, we work with our clients now versus how we did 25 years ago. Yes, technology has changed the relationship part of it, but at the end of the day, it's a face-to-face. It's a sit-down. Um, again, we're not for everybody. For the people who can do it yourselves, I mean, God bless you. I mean, that that's that's awesome. We're for the the people who don't have the time, don't have the inclination, or like, hey, you know what, you, <laughs> yeah, it's right. like like you know that I can't fix my own car, <laughs> so <laughs> that, you know that's it, but. It, at the end of the day, we're doing the same things from a philosophical standpoint that we did 25 years ago. How we do it changes in, in terms of the technology and being able to, you know, use your phone and to do, you know, Skypes and, and so forth. So that's where I think that how we embrace technology and what technology looks like 25 years from now, that will change it. But at the, at the core of what financial advisors do in the, the personal base, I, I think that's going to be exactly the same. Do you see anything with like the, uh, say the cryptocurrency? Like, does that affect anything that you guys do other than this? You know, people who want to speculate in that currency. No, I mean, per se? until it becomes mainstream, no. Um, Ameriprise has said, you know, we want nothing to do with it, and I'm okay with that. <laughs> uh, it, 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 we're we're an older company. I mean, we've been around since 1894 in some kind of incarnation because we were IDS and so forth. Um, and that's kind of always been our mantra. We'd rather kind of be late to the party and kind of figure it out. Because I still remember back in the tech crisis, uh, we didn't have many of the dot-com investments. And I'm very thankful now <laughs> <laughs> because seeing some of those, and I just remember we had a couple. And, and it was in 1999, one of the small cap funds had a return of like 125% for the year. Oh, yeah, I remember some of those. <laughs> and you're showing the Morningstar report to the client like, uh, I I don't know, even about 25% of this, you know, just, um, again, it, they're the, I mean, we're still talking mutual funds now. We're just mentioning your yeah. father. I mean, yes, there's, 
the exchange traded funds, which are the indexes, which uh, there's 9,000 of them. There's more of those than there are mutual funds. Um, I think the industry will change on that standpoint. Um, I think that that's where you'll see some of the, uh, you know, the, the fee compression and so forth like that because it makes sense. I mean, some of these mutual funds are billions of dollars and still charging 1.5%. Well, come on, really? Yeah. <laughs> I think you can volume discount down. Um, I, there'll, there'll always be something new with that, maybe this new form of mutual fund or, or index or annuity or, or insurance. I mean, the insurance business has, has changed dramatically in terms of what's offered now. I mean, to mm -hmm. have, you know, when we first started, we had a, a nursing home only policy, you know, which is like car insurance, mm -hmm. to now having five different options of building a long-term care strategy, which are amazing. So I think some of those things will, but the core of what I do, yeah. That would make me 75. Hmm. So, yes, when I'm sitting at my desk at 75, thank you, Jim, yeah. um, I still think I'll be doing the same exact thing. It'll be different tools and, and all that kind of – but I think at the core, mm -hmm. we'll still be exact the same. It's that personal relationship, which I think that's why I love what I do. I've been doing this 25 years. I, it's why we run into the office every morning. It's like I want to see what's going on. I want to talk to my clients. I want to make sure everything's okay. Mm -hmm. I think that's always going to be the same for yeah, us. Yeah, I was, I was reading too in the news the – the guy who um, predicted the housing market bubble, right. the guy with the big short movie was yeah. made after, he, he came out with a statement saying that he sees that with the index funds. Yeah. Now, I don't, I don't understand how he explained it. I mean, how would you have a bubble in an index fund? Is it just because, of the like you were saying, the compression aspect of that they're just – or is it more that people are going to really – because one of the things that uh, I think Warren Buffett even warned is that Basically, eleven people control forty percent of the U.S. stock market. Yeah, because these index funds are owned by so they're own they're so big, and the the way they vote in their stock, you know, because they still own the stock, yeah. they vote yeah. for you. Yeah, and there's a committee, you know, a committee of like ten people basically right. at each of these companies, or there's ten people total that have the actual power right. to vote in companies directors and things yeah like that. and I, like, I you know how that does has that, to change at some point yeah and, and again like I, you know it's how does that affect the individual investor in terms of that i mean if, if you have the s p 500 i mean yeah there's 500 companies and yeah that's possible but that's kind of a deep dive you know i, I know there's been some talk in, in in the past years about you know the trading volume in them because they trade through the day as opposed to mutual funds settles up at the end of the day that there's been more concerns about like if there's mass trading and what does that do to the quick pricing of it? Because there's been some of those, you know, through, you know, the past 10 years where these volatile days were, it, it might create a hiccup, so to speak in the ETF. Now I, I just think it's, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a reach, but I, yeah. you know what? Hey, if that's, he, he called the old, I may have to think yeah. twice in terms of what he does, but that that's, you know, we talk about active management, you know, and in, if the mutual fund is owning the same stocks as the index, I, I think it would you know, go right into the mutual fund standpoint of it. But I think that's also where you yeah, have to be active. Again, having diversified, too. diversified, <laughs> having a professional relationship with somebody who's looking at it and can make a decision and say, hey, you know what, maybe we just go to cash for a little bit. <laughs> or we yeah. look at some alternative investment because – and that's also what is else, else is out there. It's like, you know, the stock, the bond, you know, mix – may not be working so where else are you investing hmm. yeah i was thinking too while we you just mentioned it because of different kinds of investments like is um it's sort of a niche thing is this uh like social investing mm -hmm. so is that something i could see more millennials like really getting into that because of the you know investing in companies that are sustainable yeah. or you know have different ethical standards or yeah and we have we have several portfolios in fact the merit prizes embrace that they just rolled out three new uh managed uh, strategies that 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 take on the the, the social or embrace the, the the socially conscious um it's funny because in the past they've gotten a bad rap by the industry of well they don't perform they perform pretty well i mean let's yeah. be, be honest um, but it is interesting and, and it, you know, for, I think that's the personal discussion and having with clients because they may not know that, but if you find out more about their interests and, you know, you know, um, we love the nature conservatory or whatever it is. And so, yeah. okay, well, you know what, Hey, how about we talk about something we can put in your portfolio with that? Um, or, or, you know, uh, it's, you know, the carbon footprint and there's all kinds of investments that, that are out there, um, you know. Um, you Even things like, um, like I know for 
from charitable standpoint too, like you could do this micro investing mm -hmm. for people who are doing uh, almost like micro banking. I've seen some apps being developed where, you know, they're trying to help third world people have uh, a banking system mm -hmm. that they get, because even if you live in an undeveloped country, you still have a cell phone. Right. You know, right. that's still something they're bringing in no matter what. So yeah. with this, then this can become your banking tool yeah. too. And so it's a way for people to invest in that. There's some people, I know this guy in India who is trying to get people around the world to invest in his fund so he could f be the one that f fuels these other right. small businesses happening in these developed nations and stuff like that. Yeah, I've never heard of that. That'd but be, it said, That'd it, be pretty cool too if it became a mainstream kind of concept. Right. The problem is how do you regulate it? Right? Yeah, I think that's the, the biggest one. I mean, it said I, I was even kind of you know tinkering around with some of, the, some of the indexes before we came in and just kind of looking at you know some of the you know the different titles i mean there's uh di disruptive technologies and you know uh technology momentum so <laughs> yeah maybe his company's in there but it's i think that's the neat thing and i think that's where you know talking with a client in terms of building a portfolio and saying well i have our things we want to talk about and, and what we want to put in but you know what are you interested in mm -hmm. and i think that's where it, it makes it more personal and saying yeah you know what so you know because then there's more ownership and it's mm -hmm. not just numbers and, and because like I said, I was talking with a client the other day and we're just kind of, you know, it's like you're looking at portfolio management and I'm like, look, you know, I could say we're going to do X and the person can say I'll do X plus 0.5. All right. Well, do they really know what you want to use it for? Yeah. You know, and, or what your interests are. And I think that the, the more you can build that personal partner, I said that that's where we kind of pride ourselves in how we work is saying, look, let's, talk about this and, and figure out let's get on the same page so to speak with that okay so then basically you know if you do your job the right way it's almost like you future proof from being taken over by a robot basically too because it, it, it's, it's not going to have that relationship no and, and yeah. Yeah, look um and be able to do the things like calm the irrational like yeah. when you have bad days in the market or companies don't perform you know something that even ai can't get to right now they can't Look at another client and say, "Hey, you know, too and, bad." And it, it, it's, it, we've, it's funny because I, we have these discussions, and, and and you hear about, you know, see the articles about robo investing and taking over, you know, our business and so forth. I mean, I was, there's always been robo investing. I mean, that's what Vanguard and Fidelity and, and all those are. It's, they're for the people who want to do it themselves, which is fine. Right, right. I feel, and again, doing this 25 years, there's always people, and again. We're a small family-based practice. My yeah. wife works in the practice. You know, Kyle, you know, is his family is part of the practice. My son interns. So, I mean, we're a, a close-knit group, and that's what we want to have. We'll always be able to find those people to join our family. That that's because right, yeah. we know there's people who are out there. Like, I'd rather sit with somebody and talk to them face to face. So, right. we don't need. And a you're the tiebreaker because yeah. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, if my wife and I disagree on how to do something, you need a tiebreaker. Thanks, so Jim. I would, appreciate well, that. Well, I mean, not, not that we have to do that that yes, much. Yes, not but, yet. But, you know, that's that's also the role that you play because having that third person involved in your investing decisions. Yeah, and I think I said we even had some clients comment that, uh, you know, our meetings turn into marriage therapy. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not really trained on therapy, so you're taking a little risk at that. But, it, but I think that's important. I mean, sometimes people just want to talk it out. And... You know, the AI doesn't have that yet. I mean, I'll be scared yeah. when that <laughs> happens. Um, but it's sometimes the shoulder to, to cry on. It, it's, you know, we're involved in these, all these other life events from the new home purchase to the retirement to mm -hmm. the passing of loved one to, you know, the, the new house. Having somebody that you can pick up the phone and call and say, hey, Steve, Kyle, you know, Arlene, Christine, you know, can, can, can you help out with this? Or... You know, just getting a call from them, updating and saying, hey, listen, I just got out of the hospital. Let you know why I've kind of been off the radar with you guys. And then we, we call back like, do you need dinner? You know, can we help you out? And yeah. it's 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 a whole different thing of what we're trying to do. Again, it's 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 well, and you, when you have the same person, too, it's you don't have to keep saying your story over and over. Yeah. Again. It's like, you know, you know, if I have to go to the doctor, I don't want to go this. I want to go to the same doctor, so I don't have to explain yeah. all my medical history before yeah. every single time I have to do it. Well, the, the funny part is, is that we get we get the most guff when somebody gets our voicemail. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, 
we, we kind of expect you to pick the phone. Like, well, yeah. the, the, a couple of the other lines are busy, so we're just, you know, but we get right back to you right, and, right. and we'll, we'll, we'll chat with it. But I said, uh, now look, we, we love it. We just said it's uh, it's very family based. We, we appreciate the trust that it's placed into us by, by our clients and, and being there for whatever life event that they have, or, you know, or just going and enjoying, uh, you know, the, the anniversary of your company, yeah. which was, yeah. which was awesome by the way. Oh, thanks. Um, all right. So at that point, let's take a break and then we'll do our historical story. So hold on. Oh folks, you know what that music is. That's the time for modern design. This blue thing is a really new trend. A lot of the designers are trying to introduce blue as a new cabinet color. This is topical for you guys. <laughs> this is really topical. And the mother said, well, I'd like her room to be gray. And, and the little girl said, Mom, gray is the color of depression. <laughs> Hi, this is Rich Scuderi of Modern Design. We're on live every Wednesday from 2 to 3, and you're listening on WHCR-DB. You're listening to WHCR-DB, HuntertonChamberRadio.com. Brought to you by the Hunterdon County Chamber of Commerce, the voice of business. For over 50 years, Hunterdon Medical Center has been a leader in delivering comprehensive medical and health services to our community. Our staff is committed to providing the highest quality of care to our patients. If you need a physician, we can refer you to over 300 of the best. Call Hunterdon Medical Center's Physician Referral Service at 1-800-511-4HMC or visit us on the web at www.hundredandhealthcare.org. When it matters most, our award-winning team of emergency physicians and nurses provides sophisticated care 24 hours a day. Superior emergency care at a moment's notice. Hundred and Health Care, your full circle of care. All right, we're back. Uh, Jim Minadio and Steve Walker here, Tech Hundred and Radio, and uh, as promised, the uh, story at the end of the show. So, what I did was I looked up the history of mutual funds. So it goes actually back all the way to the 1770s. Wow. So uh, the famous uh, British East India Company, uh, they had borrowed heavily during the uh, boom years that supported its uh, colonial interests, you know, specifically North America, you know. And we had this little revolution that kind of screwed up their uh, <laughs> their uh, financial picture. So they actually sought a bailout from the British Treasury right. because they were actually considered too big. They were the original right. too, too big, big to fail, fail company. Yeah. So um, and the repercussions of this were felt across the continent of Europe. So and around the world. So at the same time, the Dutch were facing their own challenges and expanding and exploring, like the British and. Um, taking basically the same risks. And it basically, uh, th this article talks about that draws parallels to the banking crisis in 2008, right. you know, history repeating itself, right? So against all this stuff that was happening, a Dutch merchant named Adrian uh, Ketwich uh, had the foresight to pull money from a number of subscribers to form an investment trust, the first mutual fund in 1774. The financial risk to the mainly small investors was spread by diversifying across a number of European countries and American colonies where investments were backed by income from plantations and early vision um, of today's mortgage-backed securities. So basically they were you know, mortgage-backed securities because uh, they weren't on any particular industry. Right. It was all plantation-based. Uh, the subscription was a closed-end It was a closed -end fund, um, and they had 2,000 shares, basically. Right. Uh, and after that, participation in the fund was available only by buying shares from existing shareholders in the open market. So they had a nice closed uh, fund there. Um, they had annual accounting, and the investors could view um, if they requested. And two subsequent funds were set up in the Netherlands uh, to increase the emphasis on diversification to reduce risk. So they were the first to do this. And... Um, the fund survived until 1824. So I was going to ask you that, Mike. What, so, what name is it under now? <laughs> now it's called Vanguard. No, yes. <laughs> no, it's the, it, it survived until 1824. Um, let's see. Uh, um, it doesn't say. Okay, so yeah. It didn't say exactly why it, it uh, closed out, but 1824. So maybe there's a, a war or something else that was happening. And then it really didn't happen... Um, 
a lot of mutual funds didn't exist until the 1890s in Europe. And then the first U.S. one was the uh, Massachusetts Investors Trust. Uh, it was created in 1924. Uh, it was the first mutual fund with an open-ended capitalization, allowing for the continuous issue and redemption of shares by the investment company. So after one year, it grew from 392,000 in assets, uh, grew to 392,000 from 50,000 wow. in the first year. So that's pretty good. Well, then how much Capital, did it go down capitalization, there? Capitalization, yeah. yeah. How much did it go down there in the uh, Great Depression? I didn't, I didn't look that up. I should have... <laughs> I, I forgot that that was right after that. So you know, that's the, the interesting part. We look at you know the Morningstar reports now, and you know, with the Great Recession, as they call it, the two thousand eight two thousand nine financial crisis. Yeah. Because we're almost ten years from that, there was that dip is you know almost going to be off the radar with that. So look, it, it's interesting. You know, you were asking me about where do I see the industry going in twenty five years, and then we talk about you know mutual funds being around for you know. 200 plus yeah. years so i still think there'll be mutual funds you know they yeah. can, whether or not they're cheaper or whatever they might be i think they'll still be it's a simplified way for somebody to invest in a lot of companies and hire somebody to do that for them and i think there's always going to be a need for that right. whether it's a, the mutual fund or if they return them and call it a robo fund or whatever it is right, right. i think that that'll always be there yeah so this was a uh, an article by the uh Investment Institute of Canada, so they, they kind of the rest of it's focused on Canadian uh, investment. But like you said, there's a chart of assets under management going back to 1900, and you can see yep. the 2008. Yep. You probably have the similar yep. chart there in yep. front of you. See, it's like you barely can see the 2008 drop. <laughs> I mean, it just it's no bigger dip than like 2001 when we had the bubble yeah. at this point. So it really is uh, interesting that no matter what you do day to day. In the long term, money's just going to keep growing because we're just keep doing things as a, yeah. as humans. We keep producing. So there'll be another bubble. We don't know what it is, and you know, we'll we'll ride through it. All right. So we're uh, unfortunately we don't have uh, David anymore to uh, tell me when time's up. Uh, he's his show usually after mine. Uh, he went off to school, off to Hofstra. So uh, you know, if you're listening, David, uh, hope you have a good semester, and um, you know we'll miss your show afterwards. Uh, so. To close out, uh, thanks, Stephen, for coming. Um, thank to all the fans that are watching on Facebook and YouTube. Um, you can watch this on Facebook if you probably are now. And then it gets archived there or YouTube. We post it on the um, Zero Surge has a YouTube channel. Yeah. And there's a Hack 100 and Radio uh, link there so you can see all the shows that way if you don't want to get into Facebook. Uh, thanks to the Chamber for giving me the opportunity, Mark and his team at Economic Development for their encouragement and, short and support. Uh, the gang back at Zero Surge, uh, Donna, Deb, Jen, Tony, Dave, and John. Uh, thanks to Debbie and Nick and Cora. Uh, Nick, have a good uh, semester at uh, Montclair. And uh, to all the rest of you innovators out there, the original meaning of innovator was that you're a rebel. So keep rebelling against the doubters and make your